Bill Cipher should be a ridiculous and silly villain. He is the giant Illuminati pyramid. He's kind of a meme character in a way. And all the quippy catchphrases he spits out do not help with that perception. But he is also genuinely terrifying. He is the cackling nihilistic menace of the absurd. And because of that, he makes a fitting final antagonist for Gravity Falls, a show that is so deeply invested in what people care about. Everyone in the show deeply, deeply cares about things. Everyone is very overt, very hard on their sleeve. Mabel is the most obvious example of this. She is very, very passionate about her boyfriends, about her sweaters, about her pig, about basically everything in the world, and it never occurs to her to be anything less than exuberant. When she does become more melancholic at times, not momentarily sad, but genuinely despairing. It's a bit shocking because it is so different from how she normally acts. We do not know what to do with this version of Mabel, and she does not know what to do with herself either. A lot of these quote-unquote quirky or zany things about her can seem a bit silly, but they are part of who she is. They are a part of her identity. They are a part of how she fundamentally views herself in the world. She doesn't know what to do with herself if she lost that, and she is afraid of losing that as she grows up. But the same desperate, wholehearted emphasis on caring is very clear regardless of what character one examines. Dipper presents himself as the more logic-minded one of the two, the more rational one. He views Mabel's exuberance with a kind of disdain. Or disdain might be a bit too harsh, but he views it as fundamentally childish. Of course, what the show implies is that Mabel, though she doesn't know it, is in many ways wiser. She knows how to treasure those moments, as opposed to Dipper's tween age apathy toward those things, which can be as childish and as foolish. Dipper cares about things as deeply even if he doesn't like to admit it. He cares about mystery and uncovering the secrets of the falls. More importantly is what that means for his character, which is that he's someone who likes to try to figure things out. He enjoys a puzzle, but he also enjoys the pursuit of solutions. He enjoys the role of the detective, bringing order and coherence to a wild, uncertain environment, but he also enjoys that wild, uncertain environment to the extent that it allows him to have that opportunity. It's exciting for him. He also has his tween age crush on Wendy, which does not go well. It is embarrassing for him to an extent as all crushes of children that age on someone significantly older than them tend to be. But the show does not make fun of him any more than Wendy does. Now, it understands him as a bit foolish, but it fundamentally sympathizes with him nonetheless. Even someone like Little Gideon, who is our season one villain and is a scoundrel, he cares about the wrong thing, sure. He is selfish, he's manipulative, he is... rather 
gross about his affections for Mabel, but at least he cares. He cares about Mabel, even if he goes about it in a very icky way. He cares about his plans. He cares at least about his own personal ego. That's something, at least. Bill does not. Bill does not value life. He does not value this world. Pain and suffering mean nothing to him. And that is why he is the great villain of this show. The character that is probably the best foil for Bill is, interestingly, Stanley. And so it's fitting that Stanley plays such a pivotal role in helping defeat Bill in the end. Unlike Stan Ford, who is a bit simpatico with Bill and is tricked by him simply by Bill appealing to his ego, Stanley fundamentally has a cynical exterior that masks this very warm, if crusty, tenderness toward other people. Yes, he's a liar and a cheat. Yes, he is not a particularly moral person. He cheats on his taxes. He has many, many venial sins to him. But he still cares about the kids. He still cares about his brother. He still cares about these grand missions that he has set out for himself. Especially his mission to bring back his brother from the mysterious portal into which he disappeared. Bill is the complete opposite. His tempting power might seem alluring at first, but in reality there is nothing underneath except pure nihilism. The fear of Bill is the fear of the cosmic other, this immense apathy toward existence manifested in a great, unknowable creature. A lot of this is traced back to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, who does, in fact, do a lot to solidify that this idea by placing it on a cosmic scale and in the idea of these great monsters. But, in reality, this is just a transmuted fear of the sublime, that we can trace back to Romanticism in the 19th century. The sublime is a mix of grandeur, almost majesty in a way, with the terrifying, the immense and uncertain and inscrutable and mysterious. There's a sense of the fundamental limitations of human knowledge and human understanding when confronted with the sublime. Staring at a towering lonely mountain in the distance, or into the depths of a great chasm, those are both examples of the sublime. Now, the sublime can be beautiful and transformative. It can even, for someone like Edmund Burke or Arthur Schopenhauer, be a guide to wisdom. But it can also be just absolutely terrifying, which is what it is for Gravity Falls in the case of Bill. And this brings us to the contemplations of existentialism, which has superficial similarities with nihilism, but is fundamentally the opposite. The kind of high school version of existentialism is, oh, there's no innate meaning in the world, but we can create meaning for ourselves. It's a bit more complicated than that if you actually read the philosophy but as a short, digestible summary, that's not wrong innately. A broad amount of writers in the existentialist tradition, from Nietzsche to Martin Heidegger to Jean-Paul Sartre, they all talk about the innate unfixedness of things, how our ideas of ourselves and the world around us, which appear so solid, to the initial impression, are in fact vague, they're watery, they're misty, they're constantly in the process of being remade and transformed. 
what we think of as truth and beauty, and virtue, all these grandiose ideas that we have for ourselves, they are in fact just the constructions that we make. These are not fixed terms, they are terms that are constantly unstable, constantly in the process of transition. And yet the existentialist does not succumb to despair about this, or to banal platitudes about, oh, nothing matters, or these ideas of justice and virtue aren't important because they are not fixed or stable, because they're man-made to a degree and always changing. For an existentialist, this recognizing of the nullity of things, it, the lack of this pure, unchanging, transcendent essence, is sobering, but it is also an opportunity. It allows us and forces us to accept our own responsibility in the world. It's not about a flight from responsibility, it is about the acceptance of responsibility. The acceptance that these things are transient, they are unstable, they are fluctuating. Even our ideas of ourselves in the world and the people we love, the people we care about, all those ideas are fluctuating, but they matter. And they are still worth fighting for. They are still worth trying to create and forge conceptions about who we are, what we believe. What does virtue or beauty mean to us, specifically here in the world in which we live? In a way, it is relativistic, but it is not that in the sense that, that term relativism is used by its detractors to mean that absolutely everything is no better than anything else, and that the world is ultimately unimportant, we should just follow whatever impulses strike us. No. That's the, this is the exact opposite of that. It is the fundamental recognition that because everything is fluctuating, because everything is unfixed and unstable, we have a far greater responsibility to ourselves and our fellow human beings to create together meanings of who we are both by ourselves and together in society and these terms that we care about these values that we care about we it's up to us to create ideas of those that are meaningful that give coherence to the world gravity falls is not about uh, stating existentialist precepts although kind of <laughs> there is this rather hilarious bit at the end of one of the later episodes where Mabel's uh, imaginary the dream boys come out and they're stuck outside of Mabel land, Mabel's imaginary dream land in the apocalyptic wasteland that Bill Cipher creates and they quote some uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. It's supposed to be funny, and it is funny, but it does also draw attention to the ideas that the show is talking about. Bill doesn't care, and that's what makes him terrifying. That's what makes him fundamentally antagonistic to what the show is about. Because the show is about accepting that, yes, there is a degree of flux and transformation in everything. All those beautiful, serene moments that we value so much, they will fade. They are not eternal. And yet, it is for us, it is our privilege and our responsibility to find some degree of purposefulness and significance in the recognition of that transience and trying to navigate it in the world in which we live. If I had to sum up this show in two words, it would be Summer Ends, which is what Dipper says to Mabel in Dipper and Mabel versus the future. These pleasures are great, and they should be enjoyed, and we need to have a recognition that they matter, and that they are worth caring about. But they also end. They inevitably end. And we need to grapple with that fact, that inevitability.
And Gravity Falls is about doing this together, as a group. The end of the show brings together all the characters that we have come to know and care about, some of whom are good people, some of whom are a bit less good. But the show brings them together not only because it's a nice way to narratively and formally bring closure to the show, but also because it demonstrates that there is something that all these people have in common. They care about the world. They want it to continue existing. That even in the midst of the impermanence of things, there is value in treasuring these moments together, in treasuring experiences together. That even in their ambiguous and ambivalent shades, the experiences of life are still worth supporting against the complete nihilism that Bill Cipher represents. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can. And if you want to see more videos like this one before anyone else, go and rewatch Gravity Falls. It's a great show, and it really deserves the enduring fandom that it has. I always love the chance to talk about existentialism with everyone, particularly in a relevant context like this. And I do think it's relevant when talking about Gravity Falls, and especially the need to fight against what Bill Cipher represents. Adios, comrades.